Let's just make sure this works. I'm sorry, it seems to have trouble with this. Click the mouse on the actual. Ah, okay, I see. I see. Uh, Okay, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Hey, hey, thank you. So, so uh, I'll try to flesh out some of the things um, that we discussed yesterday, but mostly I'll continue to spout generalities while other people are working hard. So, um, uh, but again, I made no secret of what you're getting. So, uh, I'm going to start out talking about some, in fact, very general facts about covering spaces. I might even get some technical things wrong, but I hope it'll be mostly okay. Because understanding this notion of a universal object is one way of at least conceptually putting together a lot of the facts about various kinds of fundamental groups. That thinking about the universal object that uh, leads to the construction of the fundamental group is generally a good idea. It doesn't necessarily help you compute it, but it tells you what they are. So I'll start out with really just a very classical covering space that you see in topology, uh, a, a fundamental group and covering space. That, uh, if you start with a locally contractible connected space, I think you all know what the covering space is. So it's locally a fiber bundle. It's a locally trivial fiber bundle with discrete fibers. That's one way I'll define this. And um, you, you've seen uh, in topology courses, the relationship between covering spaces and fundamental group. And I'm just going to repeat that, but maybe from a slightly different point of view uh, from the one that's usually presented. Now, uh, you've seen the notion of a universal covering space. So that's just a covering space that's connected and simply connected. And it has kind of a universal property, but it's not really a universal object in the categorical sense. So the property it has, a universal covering space, a simply connected covering space, the property it has is that given any other covering space, it fits into a commutative diagram. It, the, the universal covering space maps to other covering spaces. Right? So that's kind of the universal property. But it's not universal in the categorical sense, in the sense that this map from M tilde to any other M dash is not unique. Yeah. So remember, to be an initial object in the categorical sense, given any object inside this category of covering spaces, there should be a unique map from your universal thing to other things. But there is not, that's it, this map isn't unique. So in order to rigidify the situation, uh, it's useful to talk about pointed covering spaces. So yesterday we already emphasized that it's good to think about base points carefully. So this was another kind of instance of that. So that is, we choose a point on the base space, right, and talk about the pointed covering space as simply being a, a covering space together with a point that lifts your base point B. So it's a, it's a map of pairs like this. So it's a map of covering spaces from M dash to M. Um, it's a map, uh, it's a covering map from M dash to M that preserves the base point. So now what do we do? We choose a base point B tilde inside uh, the universal covering space lying over your fixed base point B. That's what I mean by that subscript little b. It means the fiber over little b. Right. Then if you do this, this pair, M tilde, B tilde, is indeed, that's an initial object in the category of pointed universal covering spaces. These are all theorems that you'll actually see in algebraic topology. That is, given any other covering space together with the lift of that base point B, B dash, right? there is, a, in fact, a unique map now from M tilde to M dash that takes your fixed base point B tilde to B dash. So this is a universal object in the category of pointed covering spaces. Um, you can choose a different base point, then that will give you a different initial object. So, but there's a unique isomorphism between them, which makes things OK for category theory. Now. <coughs> Uh, uh, already, I think, uh, during, during the problem sessions yesterday, we said a number of things about fiber functors, and this is this one is the most basic fiber functor, where you go from covering spaces to sets by associating to a covering space M dash is fiber over B. So that's just a discrete set. Yeah? It has no structure. But then we can consider the automorphism group of this fiber functor. This is in the sense of natural transformations. The, the functors form a category by themselves, right? And you can consider maps of functors. Uh, 
And this is a kind of concrete example, relatively concrete example of something of that sort. So what does that mean? Well, what you have to do as a natural, in a natural transformation, remember, what you have to do is given any object, you have to have an automorphism of the target of the function, right? which in this case is m dash subscript b, right? So the five, that's the target of the function, uh, of the object m dash, uh, image of the object m dash under the function. So you need a compatible sequence of bijections like this. That's what an automorphism of the fiber function will be. Compatibility just means that if you have a map of covering spaces, then the bijection you are associating to M1 dash is compatible with the one that you are associating to M2 dash according to this diagram. Right? So you can write it as a equality of maps of that sort. So as I said, it's a compatible sequence of by, uh, by Jack, automorphisms of fibers indexed by the covering spaces. That's, so that's, one of, that's what this object, ought of FP, is. Yeah? So, um, it's, uh, but now, in, in number theory, we are used to these compatible sequence of objects, so in some sense, we shouldn't be too scared of this. Okay, but now, what's the point of my, my discussion of the universal object? Well, you see, if you're given an automorphism of the fiber functor, you can associate to it canonically an element of this universal covering space. How do you do it? Well, an element inside that, well, an, uh, uh, an automorphism of the fiber functor is supposed to, in particular, act on the fiber of the universal covering space, right? So we can just apply that element to the fixed base point B tilde on the universal covering space. Then we get some other element inside the fiber of the universal covering space. Yeah? Does that make sense? Right. But in fact, the proposition is that this gives you a canonical bijection from the automorphism of the fiber functor to the fiber of the universal covering space over B. So what, the way I view this is that this, so this gives you a kind of concrete way. This fiber of M tilde gives you a concrete way of thinking about this thing that seems very really horrible, your know, automorphisms of a fiber from towards that. Well, we can think of, think of it just as the fiber of the universal covering space. So why is this a bijection? Just to give you a very rough idea. Well, here's the injectivity. Right? Well, okay. Uh, can I explain this now? I, I find my own slides confusing now. Uh, uh, so, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah. So the point is that now suppose you are given uh, uh, some other covering space M dash, right? Uh, uh, so and you're, so remember, the, the, the automorphism of the fiber functor is supposed to act on the fiber of any such covering space over B. Oh, sorry, that should have been M dash subscript B. Oh, it is, but okay. Uh, that's a comma next to it, sorry. Uh, so now, but then remember, by the universal property, there's a unique map of covering space M tilde to M dash that takes B tilde to P dash, right? But then again, uh, by the compatibility of this sequence of bijections, automorphisms of the fibers, the automorphism associated to M dash is compatible with the automorphism associated to M tilde according to that equality in, in that diagram. So in fact, the point is that the action of your gamma, the element of the automorphisms of the fiber functor on M dash is completely determined by what it does to B, dash, B tilde. That's what this compatibility tells you. So in fact, you do, that, that element, what, what, uh, so, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. Uh, the, what, what the gamma does to B tilde completely determines what it does to fibers of all covering spaces. So that's what this equality tells you. And um, in fact, uh, it, it, given any other element of the fiber of M tilde over B, it's easy to define a gamma that has exactly this effect. So maybe because uh, uh, it, it's, this is something that I'll get confused by trying to do this on the fly. Maybe, in fact, I'll leave that part as an exercise. It's written very clearly, uh, hopefully clearly on the next slide. So what I've done just now is I've shown you that this is an injection, and it's not so hard to see that it's also a bijection. Right. I'll skip those slides. But in fact, an identical proof, this is also rather important. Now, suppose you have two points, B and X. So you can take the fiber functor at B and fiber functor at X, that's F subscript B and F subscript X, and you're doing exactly the same thing, gives you an isomorphism from the isomorphism of fiber functors from FB to FX to the fiber of M tilde over X. 
And the map from the left to right uh, goes the same way. So an isomorphism of fiber from test will canonically act on all fibers of, fiber of covering spaces over B and send it to an element of the fiber over X. But then it, it, you can do that simply to the universal covering space M tilde and apply your element P to B tilde. That will give you an element inside uh, uh, of the fiber of M tilde over X. Right, and that determines P in exactly the same way. Right. And of course, this isomorphism of fiber functor from FB to FX is a principal bundle for the automorphisms, just by composition of, of, of maps. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, maybe uh, I, we don't really need this to, to some extent, but just to relate it to uh, the usual notion of, of fundamental groups and uh, homotopy classes, I'll just remind you that if you had took uh, uh, homotopy classes of paths in the classical sense on M from B to X, right, then you also get this kind of canonical isomorphism to fiber from test, map of isomorphisms of fiber from test from FB to FX. And the way this is usually described is by path lifting. So if you're given an actual homotopy class of paths that starts at B and ends at X, then given a covering space, there's a unique lifting of that path to the covering space right, that starts at your B dash. So this is homotopy unique lifting property for covering spaces. right? As long as you start uh, uh, fix the initial point, any path lifts uniquely. Right? Then you can take the end point of that path, which then will be in the fiber over X. So this way, uh, by getting uh, so this is a way to get to get path in B to act on fibers of covering spaces, and in fact, this is also an isomorphism. Yeah, so in fact, all uh, uh, compatible ways of getting uh, uh, these actions, isomorphisms from fibers over B to fibers over X, come from paths in this way. So I wrote in the next slides the proof of this fact. So that as well, I'll just leave you to read in the problem session. So we'll, we'll, uh, and it's, uh, all these proofs are relatively straightforward. So, um, so let me go, to, in fact, skip to the last slide first, and then I'll go back briefly to the last slide of this segment. So what I'm uh, describing now is that classical top topological homotopy classes of paths from B to X, right? is actually the same as isomorphisms of fiber functors from FB to FX. Right? But that's also isomorphic to the fiber of the universal covering space over X. So it's just these two isomorphisms that I wanted to emphasize. So in particular, when X is B, the fundamental group with space at B is isomorphic to the automorphisms of S FB, which is isomorphic to the fiber of the universal covering space over B. Yeah, Yeah, that's a very good, yeah, of course, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so that's, that's an important comment. That, uh, so the, the, the way paths act on fibers doesn't have to do with anything, but the second isomorphism depends on your choice of beta. Exactly, yeah, thanks very much. But now, <laughs> the point is that that first object is very topological. It's hard to think about a priori about the arithmetic analogs of those things, but the second two things make sense in a much wider class of settings, yeah, and we're going to use that. Um, okay. So now, before uh, going, so I'm moving our way gradually towards this unipotent completion, so at least one approach to this. So in order to that, let me give you a brief exercise on this Tanakian formalism, because I know a lot of students have seen this in, in some form, so I thought I'd just remind you of the simplest case, in some sense, whereby this shows you how groups are related to categories of some, uh, some sort. So the simplest case is where you just start with a finite group and consider the category of finite dimensional representations of G on some field, on vector spaces over a field K. Okay? So this category, I guess I should have written this down a bit more carefully, but this is something called the Tanakian category. It's a linear category with tensor products and uh, duals uh, that are related in some suitable way. Now, similar to the case of pointed covering spaces, let me briefly recall the notion of a pointed representation. You don't see this, I guess, too much, so maybe it's not recalling, but anyways. So what is a pointed representation? It's just a representation together with a vector. 
Yeah. Similar to when you have a covering space together with the base point. So that's a pointed representation. And there is a very universal pointed representation. That's this so-called left regular representation, which is just the group algebra of G. If you take the group algebra of G, that's a finite dimensional G vector space on which G acts simply by multiplication on the left. So that's a representation which is universal or canonically in some obvious intuitive sense. But that also has the element one, right? It has uh, element one inside the field as being, uh, so that you can view that as the universal pointed representation of G. Yeah. Well, that is a pointed representation of G, but in fact, that's universal. And the reason this is universal is really quite obvious if you think about it. Given any representation big V with a vector in a little v, then there's a unique map from that representation, uh, kg, comma, 1, to v, comma, little v, right? Simply by sending an element G inside the group algebra to its action on V. So if you do this, clearly, further acting on anything on the left will just go carry over to the action on V, right? So this way, you get a map from this regular, this so-called regular representation to V. All you need is a choice of a vector in it. And this way, you get a universal pointed representation of G. Okay? So it's similar to the construction of the universe pointed, universal pointed covering space. So now, <laughs> uh, to relate to some this thing that people call the Tanakian formalism, there's this thing called the forgetful functor from this category of representations to vector spaces, forgetting the fact that it's a representation. That's all it means, right? So it's just associate to a representation. It's underlying vector space. And we can consider then the endomorphisms of this functor. So, uh, so this is similar to what we discussed earlier. What is an endomorphism of a functor? That means that for each representation, each object of our source category, right? You associate a linear transformation of the target V just regarded as a vector space, right? So you A sub, sub V is, is the way your element A acts on V, right? But it should be compatible with maps of representation. So if phi is a map of representations from V to W, you should get a commutative diagram. So it's a compatible sequence of linear transformations of the vector space underlying all the representations. That's what an endomorphism of this functor is. <clears throat> right? So if, uh, before we go on, uh, let me uh, uh, point out right away, as you know, an element of the group will definitely give you such an endomorphism. So this is tautological. Because if AV is just an element of the group, then, of course, it acts on all the representations. Right? And since this phi is a map of representation, you always get commutative diagrams like this. So elements of the group are, in particular, endomorphisms of this functor. Right. <clears throat> but in fact, similar to our universal covering space case, right, given any endomorphism of, the, of, of this functor, by applying that endomorphism to the point one inside the regular representation, you get an isomorphism between the endomorphisms at the group algebra of G. So this is an exercise. So, and the proof is very, very similar to what happens with the pointed covering space. The, the, uh, so an endomorphism is completely determined by what it does to this regular representation because of its universal property. Yeah. And given now, and in this direction, maybe it's even easier. The fact that if, you, if you're given an element of that group algebra, you get an endomorphism of functors, that's just a comment I made earlier when I said an element of the group will give you an A of that sort, right? But certainly an element of the group algebra also gives you such a way. So these are the, the two maps in the two directions. So as I said, similar to the covering space case, Endomorphism of a functor seems like a mind-blowing object, right? and then you make it concrete by using this universal thing. Yeah. Okay, so these are all uh, um, kind of generalities, but maybe I'll just make one more comment about this. So this is augmentation map from the group algebra to K that just uh, sums up all the coefficients, right? Of an element of the group algebra, and there's also this co-multiplication map. You see, the map from G to G cross G, just the diagonal inclusion, will induce a map from the group algebra of G to the group algebra of G cross G, which is then isomorphic canonically to the group algebra of G tensor the group algebra of G, right? And this induces, this, you can view this, people who like to think about abstract Hopf algebras and so on, like to point out that when you take tensor product of two representations, initially it's a representation of the tensor product of algebras, 
right? But it's this core multiplication that allows you to turn it into, a, uh, into an element and representation of G itself, right? But then, uh, with, with respect to this structure, G itself can be, remember this KG, we just proved it, we can, we've figured out how to functorially recover it from the category, right? The category together with the, uh, the uh, uh, um, forgetful functor allows us to get KG, right? As being the endomorphisms of the fiber of the of the forgetful functor, but now G itself can be recovered now as being the elements inside here that are so-called group-like, yeah? meaning that the augmentation should be one, yeah? and it should go under this map delta. It should be A should go to A tensor. Yeah? So of course you can see by the definition of the map that group element elements of G will have this property, but in fact it's a minor exercise to see that these are all the elements. It's a, exact, it's this, these conditions exactly characterize how G sits inside the group algebra of G. Yeah. So there, in this way, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the road for recovering G. Right? So now, so let me put that all together. Yeah. Uh, maybe these uh, slides are really too crowded, sorry about that. But anyway, so to put it all together, okay, G, in terms of the category and the functor, G is, in fact, isomorphic to what's called the tensor-compatible automorphisms of the fiber functor. So that is, a tensor-compatible automorphism is just an, an endomorphism with the proper, well, automorphism with the property that it assigns to uh, V tensor W. Uh, the, the, the automorphism it assigns, assigns to V tensor W is the same as the automorphism it assigns to V tensored with the automorphism assigned to W. That's the tensor compatibility, right? And in fact, the previous property about uh, co multiplication and so on. Uh, is the proof that G is in fact isomorphic to exactly these tensor compatible automorphisms. Now, yet another view, which I say is sometimes useful, is that uh, instead of the group algebra, we can consider it a dual, K linear dual. If you do that, remember there's a map from KG to KG tensor KG, so this induces a dual map from A tensor A to A. It goes in the opposite direction, which then turns A into a commutative K algebra. So the fact that elements of G are tensor compatible, are group-like for the co-multiplication, is actually telling us that, of course, elements of G can be viewed as such, uh, well, Elements of G tautologically give us homomorphisms from K to G, right? Because K is, A is the, du the K linear dual of KG. But in fact, elements of G can be exactly thought of as the spec of A. These are the algebra homomorphisms from A to K. This is the same as saying that they're the ones group-like for the, for the co-multiplication. That property translates into simply the property that this linear map from A to K is an algebra homomorphism. Okay. So this is all, these are all exercises in Tanakian categories in the simplest case. Okay, now let's return to fundamental groups. So what was all this discussion about? <coughs> I wanted to figure, explain a kind of concrete way of thinking about these arithmetic fundamental groups. Right? So uh, we'll let K be some like a number of here or finite extension of QP. These are the situations we're interested in. And take a smooth curve over K. A lot of this discussion doesn't re require that. But whenever I move away from curve, I tend to make mistakes. So I'll just stick to this case for psychological comfort. Uh, now, so in this setting, let's den I'll denote by A bar the same curve regard base change to K bar over the algebraic closure. <coughs> um, uh, if we take two rational points, we're going to view them as geometric points, just compose it. Uh, so, of course, K can be included inside an algebraic closure K bar. So you can have a map from spec K bar to spec K, pay K to X, which then, of course, goes through so X bar as well, right? So you can view that B and X as giving rise to geometric points in this sense. Um, in, in the local case, when we're over a, a local field, we'll also be considering a smooth scheme with good compactification, but this only comes much later, so you can just ignore that for now. This is only when we'll discuss this crystalline drum structure that uh, I'll start to, to uh, mention those things seriously. Right. Oh, by the way, these square brackets around there isn't attribution or anything. They're the references at the end of the slide. 
<clears throat> now, so returning to uh, this categorical viewpoint, uh, even for these, say, uh, quite general schemes, you can consider the category of finite et al. covering spaces of X bar. This et al. condition, remember, it's supposed to be like the covering space, local homeomorphism condition in, 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 um, in topology, right? except you're doing it algebraically by using differential forms. So this, the notion that you have a surjective map of tangent spaces makes sense purely algebraically, and that's what uh, uh, that, that's equivalent to being a local homeomorphism in the in the differentiable manifold case. But it's a notion that makes sense in a completely algebraic category. So that so I'm not going to give you a review of uh, et al. map, but just remind you briefly that there's this algebraic characterization of a property that's similar to being a local homeomorphism. So now we have this category of finite et al. covering spaces. And similar to the case of covering spaces, there's a fiber functor associated to a point on the base that associates to a covering simply the fiber over that point, right? Except now it goes to finite sets because these are just finite covering spaces. That's the main difference. Before it went to arbitrary discrete sets, now it's going to finite sets. And in this case, uh, some of you will have seen this before. We define the fundamental group as well as homotopic classes of paths. I'm going to define them both at once as uh, simply being the isomorphism of fiber functors from FB to FX. That's the definition that you'll find in Grotendieck. But um, obviously, <laughs> it is a scary definition when you first see it, right? So as, as, I, I, as uh, I mentioned, even in the topological case, what, is, what are these isomorphisms of fiber functors? Considering these infinite collections, compatible collections in some vague way, so how does one work with this? Well, <laughs> so here's how. <clears throat> so here's the point. So a fact, so I, I don't know who first did this, probably Grotendieck or somebody surrounding him, is that there's a universal pro et al. covering of X bar. By the way, you can do this to X as well. I'm working with X bar because we're going to consider Galois actions and the fundamental groups that, that come up. So right now I'm going to X over the algebraic closure. And the theorem is, the proposition is that there's a universal pro et al. cover that has this property that whenever you take a finite et al. cover, you get a map from that universal cover to Y. So it has the property of the universal covering space. Well, so remember, I didn't say unique at the moment, but it's just the existence of this, this, this diagram for any finite et al. cover. Now, um, and what do I mean? So what does that pro et al. cover mean? It just means a projective system, compatible system, projective system of et al. covers. Right? So that when you consider a map from such a projective system to an ordinary cover, I mean uh, it's a, a, a system, at, uh, a map at every finite level that's compatible over the level. So it's an element of the direct limit from the maps from xi bar to y. So that, it, there's a universe at such thing. And how does one construct this? So uh, just very briefly. Um, so, so right now I'm assuming that X is a curve, right? Uh, uh, I don't remember if I said it. By curve, I mean what, mostly what, what uh, uh, Bjorn meant by, meant by a nice curve, except I, it's not necessarily projective in this, in this setting. So it's geometrically connected and all that. So uh, in that case, so one way you can construct this universal covering is to consider the function field of this curve and then finite extensions of the functional field. And there's this well-known notion of what it means to have an unramified extension. Right? And you just take the compositum of all unramified extensions. So that's one way of constructing this. Yeah. <clears throat> if you're comfortable with this process of constructing algebraic closure of fields, this is not so different. You just consider unramified algebraic closure in some sense. Right. <clears throat> and um, now you pick a point as before, as in the topological case, pick a point inside universal pro et al. cover, meaning it's just a compatible sequence of points, one for each level. If you do that, then this universal pro et al. cover becomes really universal. That is to say, if you're given any finite cover with the lift of the base point B to, to something on the covering, then there's a unique map from this projective system to that pair. So these kind of uniqueness properties work for finite et al. cover the same way it works for covering spaces. So um, now, 
Maybe I'll, uh, I'll lead this only a little bit later, but I'll state this now. But in fact, this universal covering is defined over your ground field. What do I mean? <clears throat> I mean that there exists a system of covers defined over K that base changes to K bar to this universal covering. Yeah. And now, the way you prove this, you can prove it in a very Galois theoretic way, but it's also useful, it, it, it's useful, conceptually useful to think about in a very categorical way. Meaning what? You see, if you look at this universal property, it'll tell you right away that this, this system is unique. So this universal pointed covering is unique. That means that if you take any element of the Galois group of K bar over K, if you pull back that covering with the Galois group, you'll get another thing with the same property. That means there has to be a unique isomorphism from this thing to the Galois, to its own Galois conjugate. This gives you what uh, very long ago called descent conditions. That shows you that this whole covering uh, uh, descends to K. So that's the construction of this x tilde. Now, but however, uh, let's be slightly careful of, about this notation. When I write x tilde, this is not the universal covering of x. To, for, to get the universal covering of x itself, what you would do is you take the universal covering of the base that gives you this x bar goes to x, and then you'd furthermore take this universal covering of x bar. So this whole composed map is the universal covering of x. But this x tilde doesn't denote that. It's just the this covering descended to k that I'm denoting by x tilde over x. Yeah. So, that's, so this has a k model, universal covering of x tilde. Now, uh, also note that when I say this, this uh, said that there's this k model, that means that this whole system also contains k rational points. Yeah. Those points together descend, descend together with, with the covering. <coughs> right. Now, um, so here are some very basic examples that you know very well. You know? So if you take your curve <coughs> to be GM, the multiplicative group, right? Then, of course, uh, you probably know that GM is its own universal covering in some sense. You just keep taking multiplication maps, right? Then this gives you uh, the universal covering of GM. Yeah? So it's sort of basic algebraic geometry. It's a good exercise to figure out why this has the universal property that I, that, that I claim. You need to do something, I guess, about Riemann Horvitz formula or something like that. But any covering, et al. covering of GM factor will, will uh, be a sub covering of something, of something of a finite layer of this. But of course, your point one also lifts to a base point of this whole, whole system, right? The one inside GM. So you get a pointed universal covering, which is base trace. Now, note that, so to repeat what I said earlier. Well, the, if your GM is defined over a field K, of course, this whole covering is defined over K. Right? And it base, so to repeat what I said, it base changes to the universal covering over K bar. And same, if you have an elliptic curve defined over K, uh, you probably know, again, that elliptic curve, by multiplication by n map, you get a projective system, which is the universal covering of the elliptic curve. Again, the universal property you can check by elementary algebraic geometry of curves. And this is, of course, clearly defined over K. So these are all examples of these models over K of universal coverings of X bar in the previous notation. <coughs> um, so now here's the main theorem that I wanted to state, that why, why I went through all this, is that, you see, if you look at this scary definition of fundamental growths as, or uh, homotopy classes of paths as isomorphisms or automorphisms of fiber functors, the same consideration that we, we uh, uh, gave in the topological case shows that, in fact, this pi 1 x bar, the homotopy classes from B to X in the sense of fiber functors, is actually canonically isomorphic. Well, canonically, after you've chosen the point B tilde, as they pointed out, to actually the fiber of this universal covering over X. Yeah. Uh, so, um, okay, so I won't give a proof of this, but it's similar to the topological case. I guess I didn't completely give a proof of that either, but anyways, you can all do it at once without too much trouble. Yeah. But, so this is canonical in the sense that also there's a, this is, uh, equivariant for the Galois action. 
So last time I referred to the existence of a Galois action on all these fundamental groups and homotopy classes of path. And the way you can think about that Galois action is just the way the Galois group is permuting the fiber of this universal cover. You can interpret it concretely as this action on the fibers of this universal cover. <clears throat> so, um, by the way, so maybe I won't stress this point so much, but uh, the way, uh, the kind of functorially, the way you define the action on the left-hand side is quite confusing, but I'll put up the diagram once anyways. It's, it's as follows. Suppose you are given an element of the Galois group an and then an element of that homotopy classes of paths. Remember, that element P is supposed to be a compatible sequence of bijections, one for every covering space, right? <laughs> so given P, it will assign uh, a bijection to, um, well, I'm, I hope I'm, I'm, okay, I'm going to get this confused, but I'll, I'll say, try to say it anyway. So given a covering X dash over X, you can pull it back via your element of the Galois group and you get another covering like this, right? Yeah. And the fiber over X, because X is rational, that's not moved by G at all, that you get an isomorphism to the fiber over X from the fiber over the pullback. So you get these canonical set theoretic bijections uh, that give you the vertical arrows. On the other hand, your element P assigns a bijection of fibers according to just definition. This is a covering space. G pullback of X dash is a covering space, so there has to be a bijection over there. And G of P is the thing that associates to this covering. Yeah, I think I made a mistake here, yes. Uh, yeah, th this should have been X dash everywhere. Sorry about that. There's, I left out the X dash. It's the thing that asso associates to X dash this commutative diagram. So that's G of P. G of P associate to X. Uh, this, uh, uh, instead of, G, of course, P will associate to X a bijection, bijection of this, or X dash a bijection of this, or, but G of P just associates this commutative diagram. That's the official confusing definition. Right? But in fact, that's the same as just acting on the fibers of a universal covering space, right? which makes it very concrete. Um, so, uh, for example, <coughs> we this, uh, so this, uh, uh, to return to the examples from the first lecture, yeah. <coughs> so pi 1 of gm bar over 1, as I said, uh, is according to the canonical isomorphism, is exactly the fiber of this projective system of n multiplication n power maps over 1, right? Yeah. But that, if you think about it, the, pro the fiber over 1 of this projective system is just compatible system of roots of unity. So this is the isomorphism of z hat 1 with pi 1 of gm bar, but also compatibly with the Galois action. Similarly, if you have an elliptic curve, the fiber over the origin of the elliptic curve of this compatible system of n multiplication mode on the elliptic curve is exactly the Tate module. So you get these canonical isomorphisms between profinite fundamental groups and rather familiar objects together with the Galois action. Meanwhile, <coughs> the, the system of nth roots of unity, nth roots of some other element x that I mentioned in the first lecture uh, is isomorphic on the one hand to the homotopy classes of path, right? together, but also together with the Galois action. I guess there was no other hand, sorry, just this, this, this is true. Yeah. And so you get a similar description for a point on an elliptic curve. So all of these are fleshing out the previous isomorphism for the special cases in terms of compatible systems of division points or roots. Okay. Again, together with the Galois action. So, um, yeah, maybe I'll skip this slide for now because it's, actually, maybe I will give you the, the, this is actually rather convenient and important for many constructions. So there's a very general construction that differential geometers know very well, but in algebraic geometry, sometimes avoid the things, so, but I'll describe this briefly. If you have a principal G bundle over a space M, right? And G acts continuously on the left on some set A, for example, A might be a representation of G, right? So that's a typical case. Then there's a notion of an associated bundle which I won't spell out in detail, but you should do once as an exercise. What you do is you do P cross A and mod out by the G action diagonally, like this. Yeah? So if you do this, <clears throat> what you get is a fiber bundle over M, which has the property that all the fibers actually now look like A, 
Remember, the fibers of P look like G, but the fibers of this associated one look like A. But the way it varies over M follows the variation of P. So that's, that's this associated bundle. Yeah. And so, for example, if G, if you have a principal G bundle P and G goes to H is a group homomorphism, you can do carry out this construction to, care, to get a principal H bundle. So this is the so-called push out of principal bundles. And um, so starting from our universal covering space, which is a principal pi 1 bundle, yeah, then you can associate many objects many bundles. For example, by considering pro-p completion of pi-1 rather than the whole thing, you get a principal bundle for the pro-p pi-1, <laughs> which is the universal pro-p et al. covering. Um, and then you can consist, consider other suitable quotient coverings yeah? uh, not, uh, in, in various different settings. Uh, maybe one thing I should before moving to the vector, vector spaces case, maybe I should say. Um, so, one way of thinking about this arithmetic theory of fundamental groups is like this. <laughs> so, uh, when you, uh, uh, so abstractly, the Galois group acts on these fundamental groups and homotopy classes of paths, and this is a rather difficult action to understand. On the other hand, you can take suitable quotients, like pro-p quotients, in, as in this case, or even some finite quotient, and ask yourself how the Galois act group acts on these quotients. Yeah. So this is, you can view this whole discussion as the theory of non-abelian Galois representations. Non-abelian in what sense? Not in the sense that it goes to GLN or V or something like this, but in the sense that it acts as automorphism group of a possibly non-abelian group. So this is, of course, this is the profinite case that I'm mostly discussing, but it's also interesting to consider actions on various finite non-abelian groups. Yeah. And how do you understand such a thing? Essentially, it amounts to taking your variety, a variety like this, right, and considering cons constructing a specific Galois cover yeah, whose fibers you understand well enough to see what the Galois group does to it. Yeah. You construct specific Galois covers and try to understand how the Galois group of your base permutes the fiber. Yeah. And this by understanding this, well, the, the, so it gives you kind of an infinite series of problems, interesting problems of working out examples and properties of non-abelian Galois representation. Take any curve, your favorite curve, try to construct covers and try to see how the Galois group permutes fibers of the cover. So these are all interesting problems, whatever you can say specifically about such actions. Now, uh, for, as far as uh, these generalities, uh, one, one important case of this uh, associated bundle is that if you take a continuous representation of pi 1, yeah, then you, the associated bundle gives you a, con a locally constant sheaf of QP vector spaces that varies in some way. Right? And what this is, this is a functor from representations, QP representation of the fundamental group to locally constant sheaves of QP vector spaces on F bar. And if you think about it, this is exactly inverse to the fiber functor that associates to a local system with stock over B. So this is an equivalence of category. On the one hand, you can take a, 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 a local constant sheaf and take the fiber over B. On the other hand, you can take a representation and consider, uh, associate to it a local constant sheaf via the associated bundle construction. And you get an equivalence of categories. Okay, finally, let me, so let me now discuss. Sorry, what time do I have? Or? I can't see the clock from here. Just five minutes, okay, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so, so this is all. Uh, <clears throat> um, so let me discuss unipotent fundamental groups. <clears throat> so um, I've already discussed this category of QP local system, but we're going to consider a very specific version of it, the category of so-called unipotent QP local systems on the et al. site of X bar. The so local system is unipotent if it admits a filtration with the property that the associated graded quotients are all constant sheaves. Yeah? Just QP considered as a constant sheaf to some power. Yeah? So, so the, the trivial uh, local system QP raised to some power. So it's a repeated extension of trivial local systems. So that's what the unipotent local system is. And if you admit a filtration like this, we say it has index of unipotency at most n. Yeah. 
Um, so, and the key theorem is that there's in fact a universal pointed pro object inside it, inside this category of unipotent local system. So what do I mean by this? That means a projective system of finite dimensional locally constant shifts that are unipotent with the property and, and a sequence of vectors in there with the property that given any unipotent local system with a choice of a vector inside the fiber over B, there's a unique map from your, your, your putatively universal thing to that pair. Yeah. There's a unique map from E to F that takes V to W. There's a universal uh, pointed pro object inside this category of unipotent local system. Now, how does one construct it? So I'm just giving you a very brief sketch. <coughs> so what you do is uh, there's a kind of completed uh, group algebra, right? You can start from your pi one and consider the completed group algebra over ZP. So you have to say all of this a little bit carefully, and I'm not going to say it carefully because I'll get confused if I try to do that. But uh, um, yeah, I guess the way to do this, so one way of saying it, maybe the, the best way of saying it is you consider uh, well, a lot of ways of doing it give you the same thing, and I forgot exactly which way ones are allowable. That's why I get confused by this. But one way of doing it, you can consider all the uh, uh, p, p power quotients of pi 1 hat. Consider the zp group algebra of that, and then consider the inverse limit over all those quotients. That's what the zp double bracket is. So that's one, one way of describing it. Inside there, you have this augmentation ideal, as in the normal case. You have to make sense that it makes sense in this uh, completed setting. So you quotient out by a power of that augmentation ideal and tensor with QP. That's for EN, right? Now note, then that is a representation, a QP representation of this pi 1. Yeah? Then you take the inverse limit. Now, since these are all QP representation, you get a projective system of local, uh, pro project a pro-local system on X bar as well. Now, this object, by the way, uh, is, is a fairly complicated object, and you can think of it as various non-commutative power series in gamma minus one. You, you see, these are all inside the augmentation idea. So, if you take sufficient, if you take power series in larger and powers of uh, larger and larger powers of such things, you get something convergent inside that that inverse limit. So, uh, you, so elements of pi one hat actually lie inside there, but it also contains funny elements like periodic powers of elements in, of the original group that you started out with, because in fact this converges inside that inverse limit. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So, um, so that's the construction. The, it's the locus, I guess I forgot to say it precisely, it's the local system associated to these representations of pi 1. Um, and this also comes with, because it's uh, the universal property, it comes, well, there are other ways of describing it too, but uh, for example, because of the universal property, it comes with various maps you know, that take your base points to tensor products of base points that gives you uh, uh, this co-multiplication at the level of sheaves and, um, well, okay. Now, what's the point of all this is that, remember, we had this category of unipotent local system. That comes with a fiber functor now, taking the fiber at B, or the pairs of fiber functors, one at B and one at X, to vector spaces, so that you can consider tensor-compatible automorphisms or isomorphisms between these fiber functors. And the unipotent fundamental group, by definition, is this object. So this is, again, a very scary definition. So in order to flesh this out, you have to study that universal object. So that's one way of doing it. Um, so in fact, so the lemma is that the endomorphisms of this fiber functor is just fiber of our universal local system at B. And uh, our, so from this, you get that the universe, unipotent completion is isomorphic to the group-like elements inside that fiber, while the uh, um, hom homotopy classes of paths, unipotent paths from B to X, is like group-like elements in the fiber over X. So this is exactly the same as in topological covering spaces. 
right? And then we can flesh out the structure further uh, uh, by considering the lower central stage. Maybe I'm out of time now. What time do I have? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, so this might not be such a bad place to stop. Uh, yeah, so maybe what I'll do. Yeah, let me stop here for today. And uh, tomorrow, um, what I'll probably do is move on to the discussion of the drum case, which in some sense is more concrete, right? And then return to the comparison with the construction I gave today. Yeah, thank you very much. Questions? I'll speak at once. Okay. Uh, in that case, <laughs> we'll break for lunch. Let's thank okay. Young again. Okay. <laughs> Too much material at once, maybe. But <laughs> Stop.